recording person just to give me the thumbs up that we're okay, we're, we're right to go. My name's Christine Jones from Australia, if you don't... <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you, fan club. <laughs> if you don't recognise the accent. Can you hear me up the back? Not quite. Okay, I'll maybe hold it a bit closer. Can you hear me now? Or does it need to be... If you're sitting in the back row, can you... Uh, you're good. You can hear me? Okay. Today's uh, talk has been listed as soil carbon from microbes to mitigation in your program. And then when you turn over to read the description, it's actually saying that I'm going to be talking about superhighways of the soil, the magic of mycorrhiza. So to overcome that little discrepancy, I'm going to talk about both. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're very, very uh, much interlinked and so not, you won't be disappointed if you come thinking that you're going to hear about one thing or, or the other. Um, I'll cover both of these. Okay, so when talking about uh, climate mitigation, I guess I need to just put this into a little bit of historical context, but I am going to be talking about soils and microbes, so it might be a little bit different to the climate talks that you're used to. Because um, I really want to just look very briefly. Some of how many of you, if you raise your, your hand, if you came to David Montgomery's talk in here this morning, okay, <laughs> right, about 80 to 90 percent of you. Well, that's absolutely fantastic because that sets a really good context for what I'm going to be talking about today. So just very, very briefly, I'm going to show uh, a few slides actually from Australia. Um, looking at the historical context of soils, but putting it in a slightly different perspective um, that than David was looking at. So in our context, I'm just going to briefly mention two people who uh, kept really good records in the early stages of colonisation of Australia. Australia was has been inhabited by people for over 60,000 years, but in the last 200 years, Europeans came and totally uh, changed everything about our environment and our, our continent, as they have tended to do around the world. Um, and two of the people that recorded those changes, one was George Augustus Robinson. So we're talking in the 1840s. Australia was colonised at the um, in the late 1700s, but by 1840s we had farms all over the place. Uh, and he was uh, trying to, his job was he was the chief protector of Aborigines. He was trying to prevent uh, European colonists from massacring Aboriginal people. Um, but he also kept a daily diary just of what he saw as he went round with his horse and wagon through the countryside. And what he saw everywhere he went, even in areas that today um, you don't see green grass, he saw luxuriant grass. He recorded this in the middle of summer, our summer or our climate in many areas of Australia is like Southern California, so it's hot and dry in summertime and cooler and moister in the winter time. And in the middle of summer, after 90 days with no rain and temperatures around 100 degrees Fahrenheit for every, virtually every one of those 90 days, it was still green. So imagine Southern California after 90 days of no rain and temperatures around 100 degrees and it's not still green now. Hundreds of years ago, probably was. He talked about carpets of colourful wildflowers uh, frequently in his diaries. He's talking about the amazing wildflowers. And, and, in, and they were in huge patches, big patches of blue, big patches of yellow, big patches of red. Sometimes we wonder what those flowers actually were, but he wouldn't have been writing it in his diary if he hadn't seen them, and deep, soft soil. Uh, quite often he referred to the fact that you could take a stick and easily push it two feet down into the ground. And the Aboriginal people were uh, using sticks to harvest yam daisies and the tubers of a whole lot of, uh, of a lot of the flowers actually had bulbs uh, that were edible, that were part of the staple diet for Aboriginal people. If you went back to those same areas now and looked at the number of people that used to live there prior to European settlement, those same areas cannot support anywhere near as many people now as they did um, back in the mid to early 18, 1800s. 
this is a painting that was done of uh, a colonial landscape in 1858. And it, it this is in the middle of summer and it's showing the green grass that's everywhere. So these are all native grasses, uh, as would have been the same situation in Southern California, perennial native grasses. You're looking at a green hydrated landscape that is now totally brown at the same time of year in that same part of the world. And here's another one from 1860 showing the same sort of thing. Uh, very little trees. All the trees that are there have been planted by Europeans. Um, again, there's a few trees in, in this photograph. They're, if you look very closely at it, they're all European trees. They're not native trees. So we actually have now more trees and less grass than we had 200 years ago in our country. Um, and another person that kept really good records was Sir Paul Edmund Streslecki. He was a Polish explorer that came to Australia looking for gold. Um, he was a bit of a man about town. He was very interested in the wives of several of our governors, as well as being a, an explorer. And um, well, he was exploring various things, I should say, <laughs> other than looking for gold. And he kept really, really good diaries of uh, the landscape that he moved through and unfortunately uh, on his death it was in his will that those diaries had to be destroyed for various reasons um, but there was a lot of very good observational material that went with those about the landscape that he was observing but fortunately he had collected a whole lot of soil samples sent them back to Kew in England and had them analysed for their organic matter content and from and these were from farms. These were samples collected from farm soils. He's not going out into the bush and collecting samples. This is, these were already being used to, mostly to produce oats as feed for horses because uh, horses were used to pull the ploughs. Uh, and he found that of those 41 samples, the 10 highest ranking soils had organic matter levels up to 37.75%. If any of you are familiar with working with organic... Thank you. <laughs> well, some of the words I'm hearing are things like photosynthesis, exudates. Okay, so we have green plants photosynthesizing, capturing that carbon dioxide and, and light and transforming it to biochemical energy in the form of uh, sugars, which are then transported to the roots and exuded into the soil as liquid carbon, which is going to feed the soil microbiome and the, the biota in the soil are going to be responsible for creating soil structure and which is then going to be uh, necessary for water infiltration and water retention in the soil. So actively growing green plants are going to support the microbes, in fact, that create well-structured, friable topsoil, and that that topsoil will have a high nutrient status and a high water holding capacity, as I'm going to explain as we go along. It was very interesting. This morning I went to uh, Kathleen's um, workshop on the gut microbiome, and the parallels between the gut microbiome, the human gut microbiome and the cell microbiome are quite extraordinary. The more we learn about the gut microbiome, the more we realise how much it actually relates to how things work in soils. So that our bodies are, on a cell count, we're about 10% human and 90% microbes, and that our microbes are basically running the show. We're just microbe taxis. And it's up to us to actually understand how those microbes work and how to support those microbes because then we are going to function. All of our organs and our brain and us as a whole human being is going to function much better if we're looking after the microbes in our gut. And there's, it's no different with the soil. Your soil can't function without a diversity of different functional groups of microbes and sufficient microbes in the soil to actually, you have to reach, um, Kathleen talked about quorum sensing. It's like if you're going to have a meeting, you have to have a quorum before you can, can go ahead. Well, it's the same in soils. You have to have certain numbers of certain groups of bacteria and fungi and other uh, organisms in the soil before the soil is actually able to carry out certain functions. It's not a matter of just having a few. We need to have a lot of certain kinds. And then we will have high nutrient status and high water holding capacity. But those microbes are all going to be plant dependent. 
Prior to 1940, the importance of life in the soil was clearly recognised and scientists were actually undertaking research into mycorrhizal fungi, which I'm going to be talking about in a, in a moment, and free-living nitrogen-fixing bacteria, which I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. In the 1890s, there was research papers coming out on those uh, organisms in the soil. So we understood the importance of them way, way back then. Uh, and a lot of that's just been forgotten over time. This is, um, so those microbial groups are plant dependent and in fact most soil microbes are plant dependent. In the same way I suppose that the microbes in our gut are dependent on us. Um, and in fact they're keeping us alive in many cases um, because when, if we pass away then they do too. It's in their best interest to keep us going and it's in the best interest of the microbes that live in the soil to support their uh, plant hosts and I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, back in 1938, Charles Kellogg said there can be no life without soil and no soil without life. They have evolved together. This is really slow to change over, sorry. <laughs> um, so as Elaine mentioned the other day, today's soils are not deficient in minerals. Um, they are deficient in microbes. And building topsoil is a biological process. Sorry, this is really slow to change, I don't know why. So of all of the microbes that are important to soil building, um, mycorrhizal fungi are without doubt uh, keystone species in this. And I think now that brings me to the second part of today's talk, which is super highways of the soil, the magic of mycorrhizal networks. So if we go back to this uh, diagram that I showed earlier, you know, what is going on underneath that that green stuff there like why is it so important for you know this is having a huge effect on the way this entire ecosystem is functioning whether or not you have something green there so you know what's under the green what, what's there that's important well one of the things as I mentioned is, go is going to be mycorrhizal fungi and research has shown that if we take an area of grassland like this this is um this is an, an Australian Grassland is on a far, in a farmer's paddock. He's got 78 different native grasses in there, and about 30 native legumes. So he's got at least 100 species in that in that paddock. But um, some English research by Jonathan Leake showed that in the top four inches of soil, of uh, well, I'll convert it to yards, two yards by two yards. Like if you took a square that was two yards wide and two yards long and just took the top four inches of soil and you removed all the hyphae of the mycorrhizal fungi that were in that soil, they would stretch all the way around the equator. I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary how prolific uh, these things are in soil, but we can't see them with the naked eye. So in one teaspoon, I think, has something like 100 kilometres of mycorrhizal hyphae in it. Um, it's it's I guess it's a bit like our gut when we're talking about what what did Kathleen say? There's three million, uh, three, oh, I forgot what she said now, 30 trillion or something. There was a lot. <laughs> we have a lot of microbes in our in our uh, in our ecosystems. Um, so I've just pinched this diagram from NRCS. Sorry, I have to refer to this board because it's being filmed from this board, but. Basically, you have the top part of your plant, which is the green that we see above ground, the roots that we don't see unless we dig holes. Uh, I hope you all carry a spade with you at all times and you're always digging holes looking at the roots of your plants because that will tell you a lot about what's going on. And then those bits we can see and then the yellow strands that are running off there, these are the hyphae of mycorrhizal fungi, which uh, I'm sure that those of you on this side of the room got that. These hugely ex the root system, like even in a physical sense, even if we don't think about all the other things that mycorrhizal fungi do, they certainly extend root systems. Um, one of the most important things that they do is actually bring water back to plants as well as a whole heap of, of nutrients. And it's been, um, this is incredibly slow. Um, you'll see diagrams like this in the scientific literature of a plant and the plant roots are the yellow bit and then these are blue bits are the spores of mycorrhizal fungi and the blue strands are the uh, hyphae of the extra radical um, mycelium of, of mycorrhizal fungi and yellow arrows showing that 
the fungi are bringing water and minerals up to the plant in exchange for sugars um, or carbon, whichever way you want to look at it. In fact, there's a whole lot of carbon compounds come out of plant roots, hundreds or thousands of different carbon compounds come out of plant roots. It's not just sugars, um, but it's pretty, that's in its simplest form that you have an exchange of energy for uh, water and minerals. So that symbiosis is well known, it's well described. Um, if we just look inside a plant root to see the exchange site, so now we're looking at the intraradical part of the fungal mycelium. This is a cross section of a plant root. Uh, these things that look like little trees or broccoli plants, these are the exchange sites where the water and the nutrients are exchanged for the sugars. If we just look at that a little bit more closely, um, it looks like an animal lung and the carbon is actually flowing this way from, from the plant tissue into the, um, into the hyphae or the arbuscle. This is called the arbuscle of an arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi and then it's collecting into, the, into this hyphae here and then it's going to move along this highway. Um, in these hyphae, there is bidirectional flow and nobody's ever been able to work out exactly how that happens. So we've got water and nutrients coming this way and we've got sugars going this way and for some reason they don't bump into each other as they move along that hyphae there. There's no dotted line down the middle it says you guys go this side and new ones go that side and they're actually moving, streaming really quite quickly and it's an extraordinary process how that, how that happens. I just learned in Kathleen's um, workshop this morning that we have bidirectional flow in our, in, a, in our vagus nerve with neurotransmitters being sent from um, the microbes to our brain and other signals coming from our brain back. So I, again, I saw the parallels between the way our gut microbiome and the soil microbiome w are working. Um, this photo from Jill Clapperton actually shows carbon streaming out from outside the plant root and off, the, this hyphae is now going off out into the soil and it's going to be carrying that liquid carbon out into the soil ecosystem and you're going to have nutrients and water coming back the other way. Um, this again is another photograph of the hyphae of mycorrhizal fungi around a, this is a, a plant root tip or even a, a root hair with hyphae coming out, millions of them. It just gives you an idea of how much they increase the surface area of a plant root. But the other thing that they do is produce a lot of sticky substances and they pull soil particles together and we see aggregate formation around plant roots when there's lots of sugars coming out um, and they're supporting lots and lots of life in the soil. We see um, how those uh, substances that are produced actually by the microbes themselves can stick soil particles together and create well-structured topsoil. So the bacteria that live around plant roots are responsible for forming microaggregates, which are tiny little soil particles, and then the, uh, the fungi help to pull it all together to form a macroaggregate. So I'm not going to spend, gosh, <laughs> I'm not going, what time does this finish? Uh, have I only got half an hour left? No, it can't be. Oh, I, oh great. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. I thought, my goodness, um, only getting started. Uh, okay, I'm not going to explain this in too much detail, but this is a, a fine feeder root, and, and these are root hairs coming off that root. The root tips are really important because that's where the plants are actually most active in the soil. That's where most of the exudation occurs, not so much out, out of old roots. And these strands, these hair-like strands coming out of that, they actually go right into that plant root and then come out. Um, these are the hyphae of mycorrhizal fungi. And pulling together the whole thing together, the orange segments in there are the mi mac micro aggregates that have been formed by bacteria. And these little yellow ellipses are colonies of bacteria that are living again off the exudates out of that plant root. Some of these bacteria will be free living nitrogen fixing bacteria or associative nitrogen fixing bacteria and I'm going to talk about them tomorrow and how important they are um, in, in the whole ecosystem and the nutrition of the plant. Some of them will be phosphorus solubilizing bacteria um, and I don't know what else we really need to know about that but what is going to happen inside that the reason that's shown as a blue 
area there is because the moisture content is higher inside a macro aggregate than it is on the outside. And that's very, very important for the life of everything. So we're talking about a microbial hotspot in the soil. We're talking about a factory where a whole lot of uh, nutrients and things are coming together because within these aggregates we have the formation of humus. And that's a polymerization process where the microbes are going to join carbon atoms together to form much longer chain articles. And included in that molecule, in those humic molecules, they're going to uh, there's going to be nitrogen in there and phosphorus and sulphur in there and all of those things are going to be polymerised by the microbes that are utilising the energy that's coming from that plant. So we can't have those hot spots in the soil or those factories, those humus producing factories in the soil unless we have green plants that are actively growing. And it's it, the cycle, it's either a positive feedback or a negative feedback. So when you have uh, green plants photosynthesizing, channeling liquid carbon to the soil, supporting the soil microbiome that's going to create better soil structure. That soil structure and those aggregates are going to be able to improve the infiltration of water and the holding of water in the soil so that then we have moister, better structured soil that's also going to be better aerated and that's going to create a better environment for plant growth which means we can have more photosynthesis which in turn is going to produce better soil. So the more photosynthesis we can have, the better the soil will be, the more photosynthesis we can have. And I'm going to show you some photos in a moment of what that actually means in terms of production, disease resistance, insect resistance, uh, milk quality, all sorts of things, that all the flow on benefits that come from that. But if you don't have photosynthesis to start with, I'm talking about like broad scale landscapes where that's really our only option for getting carbon into the soil. I'm not talking about in your home garden where you can make really beneficial products like compost and those sorts of things that are going to support the soil microbiome as well. I'm talking about if you've got, you know, hundreds or thousands of acres or hectares of land, then you really, really need to be thinking about photosynthesis and what that's doing for your soil. Then if we take the photosynthesis away, if it's not green anymore, then all those things I've just talked about are no longer happening. These micro macro aggregates are going to break down. The soil loses structure, it becomes compacted, the water can't even infiltrate. When it rains, the water's going to run off. Then we're going to get more droughts because the land is drier and more floods because there's more water going into the river systems. So floods become more severe over time, droughts become more severe over time. And a lot of it just comes back to the role of photosynthesis in landscape function and the role of photosynthesis in, cre in um, influencing what actually happens in our soils. What does it look like in real life if this is happening around your plants? This is a photo of a wheat plant um, in a, a field in Western Australia where the farmer is really concentrating on increasing their photosynthetic capacity of the land. That's a little wheat seed that's just started to germinate. Um, seeds produce roots before they produce tops. So the first thing that happens when a seed germinates is it produces roots. And look how well these roots have been um, colonised. They've been so well colonised by bacteria and fungi that you can't see the roots. And in fact, you should never be able to see the roots on your plants. If you can see the roots on your plants, then they're not talking to the soil. They're not communicating with the soil. Um, Again, the, the plant root is just there and it's formed these uh, advent, uh, adventitious roots from the top, but all of the roots in that um, photograph there are like totally, totally covered. This particular farm, they've sent samples off to the labs to have them analysed. When these wheat plants only have two, two leaves, 75% uh, of the root area has already been colonised by mycorrhizal fungi and the labs always go, all the conventional farmers have, you know, maybe two or three percent at most at that two leaf stage. So they're just amazed that there's 75 percent colonisation. This is obviously very, very important for the survival of this young seedling, um, being able to interact with all these microbes that are going to improve the structure around that plant and improve the fertility for that plant. What does it look like if we... Um, so I'm going to have to press this like five minutes before I want to see the slide. I can't believe it is so slow. It's just interrupting my train of thought because I think the next slide's going to come up and I'm standing here pressing this and nothing's happening. Um, I'll stop complaining about it now. Okay, so 
I'll try not to say that again. If this is like a close-up photograph from that same uh, field of these are just, it, it sort of looks like honeycomb or something. These are all the strands of fungi, they're not necessarily even all mycorrhizal fungi. There's a whole lot of beneficial fungi around plant roots as well. Can't tell just from looking at a photograph like that which ones they are. And you actually see drops of like root exudates as well. Like it's just, it looks delicious, doesn't it? I reckon it looks like honeycomb. But I mean, this is the amazing environment that is happening around these plant roots when they are exuding lots of carbon into the soil. You have to start thinking like a microbe. You know, if you were a microbe there in the soil, um, in, in a hostile environment like West Australian wheat belt, um, you know, that, that plant is just going to be absolutely extraordinary in terms of a provider of food. And this is another photo of the same sort of thing, like all this sticky stuff and these like cobwebby little strands of mycorrhizal fung. These are just grains of sand. This is, the West Australian wheat belt is basically sand and just how the fungi are pulling that all together and turning that into soil. In a minute when this comes up, it's going to show you what roots look like <laughs> when they're not colonised by mycorrhizal fungi, but we could be waiting till Christmas <laughs> for it to happen. Okay, so here we go. So this is the same, uh, same sand plain. This is a conventional farm, right? That's what the roots on that place look like. Poor, lonely little things. They've got no soil around them. You pull that plant up, you get to see those roots plain as day. They're not talking to soil microbes. It's a bit like uh, what our gut microbiome is going to be like if we eat processed food and we don't eat anything decent that's got some fibre and some things that are going to um, support our gut microbiome. We are not going to function very effectively and soils don't function very effectively. The soil microbiome is not being supported by the plants. We have to figure out how to support that soil microbiome to the very best of our ability um, through the way that we, we manage our plants. And in a minute it's going to show you another slide. Not really sure how long that's going to take. Oh, that's a good idea. Oh, Whoa. <laughs> thank you, Don. <laughs> right. Uh, okay, so I probably still need this one because I've got a laser. All right. Some of you will have seen this slide in millions of other presentations. It's one of the world most best known mycorrhizal slides in the world. It's actually an ectomycorrhizal fungi which live uh, outside the plant root on a little pine seedling. But this is our seedling here and these are the roots here, just this little yellow bit in the middle and all of this cobwebby stuff that's coming out from the sides, that's the extra radical mycelium. That's the, the hyphae, millions and millions of strands of hyphae of mycorrhizal fungi. When there's a lot of it, we call it mycelium. Um, and it, you can just see how much that is ex expanding the root system of that plant. At the edges of that mycelium, there will be thousands, of, probably millions of colonies of, of bacteria that will be solubilising nutrients that will be made available to that plant and that can be transported back on those hyphae, um, back to the plant roots. You know, plant roots are incredibly inefficient at obtaining minerals and trace elements and other things from soil and really they need the microbes to to obtain those and transport them it's not just a matter of so we've got liquid carbon flowing this way providing the energy for these colonies of bacteria all around here to uh, make minerals and things available minerals and trace elements available and then they're transported back on this super highway back to the roots of this plant I'll try pressing buttons and see what happens. Oh, isn't that, gosh, is that wonderful? Thank you, Don. You're worth your weight in gold. So this is just a close-up now of this is the plant root. And look at this network of hyphae coming out here. Look how much of the soil they're exploring and what they're doing and how much carbon. They're all pumped full of sugars and things. There's just that much carbon in that soil. And they're great things to eat, like if you're a, a mite or a springtail or something like that. Um, they, it's like candy floss. Uh, so they're very popular as a, as a breakfast item for the other things that live in the soil. Uh, even bacteria will feed actually on fungal hyphae. Whoops, I've got to press the button. Right, and the other thing is that they link plants together. So if we had more than one pine seedling here, they're all, the mycorrhizal fungi are actually going to link all those plants together and form a common mycorrhizal network, which is something I'm going to talk a bit more about for basically for the rest of this talk. But they can exchange nutrients by... Uh, 
uh, comprehensive experiments really on diversity that's been undertaken in the world and it's run for 15 years. It started in 2002, so it's in its 15th year now and there's some uh, extraordinary information coming out of that. One of the things that they discovered in that experiment was that the more plants that you had growing together, the more the soil carbon increased. So we know green plants are important for increasing soil carbon, but the more different kinds of plants you have together, the more quickly and the more in total the soil carbon increases. So we'd have to ask why is that? If you had the same number of plants in an area but they were a whole lot of different kinds of plants, why should the carbon increase more than if you had that number and they were all the one kind? They also found monocultures declined over time in the 15 years of their experiment. All of the ones that they were trying to keep as a monoculture, they keep losing plants. So they keep declining. It sort of tells you maybe Mother Nature doesn't like monocultures. One of the experiments that they did was where they compared having in their 10 by 10 metre plots either just one kind of plant or two kinds of plants or four or eight or 16 plant species in that, in that area and then this is a multifactorial experiment. On top of that, they put either no nitrogen or 100 kilos or 200 kilos of nitrogen per hectare, which in your, uh, your language is about 200 pounds per acre. So you can pretty much go from kilos to he per hectare to pounds per acre. So zero, 100 or 200 pounds per acre of nitrogen per year or one, two, four, eight and 16 plant species all um, multifactorial. And what they found was that if they had eight or 16 plant species, they could produce a lot more biomass with no nitrogen than if they had one or two plant species with 200 pounds per acre of nitrogen. Okay, so diversity outstripped uh, nitrogen easily. They even had it one where they went up, they just tried one with 60 plant species and the yield was double again. It was just amazing how um, Diversity was more important than fertiliser, and again, you'd have to ask why. Why is diversity having those effects? Uh, just some visual things to show you on that nitrogen. This is from Ontario in Canada. This is a, uh, from a research station where they're doing experiments with cover crops, and they had all of the kinds of crops that you could put into a cover, into a multi-species mix, growing as monocultures, and then put together in various combinations. So this is radish, just growing on its own. Um, and it, all of the plots had actually been fertilised, like had a base level of fertiliser put over them, but this radish growing on its own is quite clearly nitrogen deficient. And then right next to it, there was radish that just had some sunflowers and oats and a little bit of phacelia in there, hardly any. There's a phacelia plant there, sunflower there, little bit of oats through it, you know. Um, and there's no nitrogen deficiency there right next door to each other. If we put those two photos next to each other, <laughs> we can see that um, we have nitrogen deficiency right next door to no nitrogen deficiency. And the only difference is that those uh, radish in that non-nitrogen deficient plot have a few other plants in with them. It makes you wonder why we worry so much about weeds, really. And um, some, another piece of Canadian research that just came out this year was that we're looking at pastures, but they had in if they increase the number of species in their grassland from one to 10, it had twice the economic value of increasing the species from one to two. Okay, so if you just doubled the number of species that you had, and a lot of grasslands in places like well, on dairy farms, for example, in Australia and New Zealand would have ryegrass and clover and that would be it, or just ryegrass. So they have either one or two plant species in there and if any other plants dare to grow there they'll come and spray them because they consider them to be weeds but if they had 10 plants in there it would actually have double the economic value um, and that was due to improved rates of carbon sequestration same as the German experiment was finding we're getting more carbon sequestration when we have more species so the fact when we have diversity we have more carbon sequestration and that's relating that's following through to all of these other benefits that we're seeing in these, um, in these plant communities. So when we stand on soil, we're standing on the rooftop of another world. That's not my quote, but I like it. I just stole that. Um, so this is a 
from the North American prairies, just showing that the variation in root architecture that you have with a whole lot of, when you have a whole lot of different kinds of plants. Some of you would have seen this slide before. I think it's an NRCS one. But what, what's missing from that diagram is the huge variation that will be under that ground in terms of the microbial networks and, the, and in particular the mycelial networks. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a native grassland. Uh, it could be just one of our multi-species mixes like farmers are using these days in their cover crops. Or this one's actually a multi-species pasture that's just got, um, well, I don't know about the beets being pasture, but most everything else you would find in a, in a pasture in our country anyway. Um, but, you know, even though they have different kinds of roots and people have often said, well, you get complementarity, you get, uh, um, you know, uh, everything has a different niche, like this one's obtaining nutrients from down here and these ones are obtaining nutrients from up here. And so when you've got a whole lot of different kinds of root architecture, you get this like physical um, complementarity of, of occupying different places in the soil but now we know that it goes way way beyond that that when these are all linked with these common mycorrhizal networks that it's um, it's almost logarithmic what's happening so common mycorrhizal networks if you google that now you'll start to find there's more and more papers coming out like scientific papers I mean this is from one of those where they've just looked in this case just looked at two species they've looked at sorghum and flax and what they discovered in this experiment was that, so you've got the roots of the plants here and then the blue, little blue lines are the mycorrhiza and the fact that they're linked. Grasses as a general rule contribute quite a lot of carbon to soil pools and in this experiment they found that the green, um, the green arrows are carbon investment. So you'll see that there's more carbon coming into the soil or into the common mycorrhizal network from the sorghum than there is from the flax. It's not really contributing very much. The other arrows are phosphorus uptake and nitrogen uptake. And you'll see that, that for the flax, that's huge. It's not contributing much carbon to the common mycorrhizal network, but it's actually removing huge amounts of phosphorus and nitrogen. And so that when they're, when they're all growing together as a, as a mix, the, um, in a mixed culture, what they find is that the flax actually grows 300% more. The, carb uh, the sorghum grows about 7% more. So they both benefit from mixture, but some plants benefit more than others. But the thing about having them in a common mycorrhizal network, which is the next bit that I'm going to get to, is that there's a whole lot of things change. Like it's not just about those individual plants. When you have a whole network, it starts to change everything, including landscape function and climate through the role that it has on carbon. So while most of the research has only considered one or two plant hosts and one fungal partner, and that's because very difficult to actually look at more than that in a laboratory, in reality there are multiple plant hosts and multiple fungal partners, and they're all connected to each other. Um, and it'd be pretty hard to try and sort it out, I think, scientifically. But these are this is a photo of some of the different spore uh, shapes that you get in mycorrhizal fungi. So it gives you a bit of an idea of the kind of variation that's there. And that's another one showing different spores, fungal spores in the soil. I mean, it's, you know, the variety is quite, quite impressive. Um, and then when we put all those things together and, and we have all those different species interacting with a whole lot of species, different species of plants, um, I'm wondering whether what we are seeing is quorum sensing, which is we've now discovered was what happens in our gut, that just having a few beneficial bacteria in our gut is not going to bring anything like the effects that we see when we reach a quorum and we have enough for those bacteria to actually start performing vital functions that our body needs. And I think it's probably the same in the soil. We've been looking in our agricultural systems at incredibly simplified landscapes, nearly always monoculture. And when you've got monoculture, you are not going to get the diversity of functional groups, even within the, even within the mycorrhiza themselves. You're not going to get the diversity that you need for your soil to function properly. I don't know whether properly is the right word, but. And what we find when we start to look into it is that mycorrhizal fungi and a whole lot of other microbes as well. I mean, today I'm talking about mycorrhizal fungi, but you could probably say the same thing about a whole lot of other 
um, microbes that are in your soil, that they influence just about everything that happens. Um, they influence food quality because they're influencing the uptake of nutrients by plants. They influence watershed function because they're influencing soil structure. And in the, for those, uh, for the very fact that they influence the way light is intercepted, the way, the way they affect the hydrology, the way they affect the temperature, um, through all of the interactions that take place, they're going to affect local, regional and even global climate. And of course, the profitability of farming. I mean, people that are growing crops in order to make money may not necessarily be terribly interested in what that's going to do to watershed function or regional climate, um, but they will certainly be very interested in what it's going to do to the profitability of farming. Now, some of these things have been known for a very, very long time, although the details of it wasn't known and the implications, I guess, weren't known, but indigenous Americans have been um, Produce, were producing corn prior to European settlement using the three sisters, having never having corn monocultures. It was always corn grown with beans and squash. All three of those plants are highly mycorrhizal and probably sufficiently diverse in the plant families that they come from to have uh, created a fairly robust microbiome. And certainly um, there was enormous amounts of corn being produced in this country at the time that the Spanish arrived. They talked about armies marching past cornfields that were a mile wide and five miles long and um, huge reserves of, of corn grain. And a lot of those soils now that indigenous people were farming without tractors, without fertilizers, without just actually using diversity and understanding how plants interact understanding their soils obviously a lot better than we do today, were able to produce very, very productive corn crops where today with all of the technology we have, we can't produce a thing. A lot of that land has now been abandoned. It's only suitable for growing pine trees. Uh, this is a photo of Gabe Brown's chaos garden where he's just thrown a whole lot of different plants in together, 20 different kinds of vegetables and 20 kinds of flowers. and. Um, he has incredible productivity um, in a very small area and amazing diversity. No room for weeds and no pests or diseases, no need for any fertilizers. So what do we see in conventional agriculture today? We see how much photosynthesis is there. And even if we go to no-till, if it's no-till without cover crops, there isn't any photosynthesis there either. We've just replaced cultivation with chemicals and in some ways, when you start to look at how toxic our foods have become, um, the amount of pesticide residues that we have in our bodies now, the number of illnesses that we're starting to see in our kids, you're starting to wonder, well, was that really a good move going from there to there? But there's a lot more that we can do. Um, we really have to start thinking about photosynthesis and diversity, and then it probably doesn't really matter which system we're using. Um, provided we we look after the photosynthetic side of things. So if we were to cover that ground with a multi-species cover crop um, and start rebuilding soil rather than ha leaving it bare and dying, uh, it's going to make a huge amount of difference. And even in our environment, it doesn't matter whether that just grows a few inches and then gets heat stressed and dies. It's better to have something green for as long as you possibly can rather than having nothing there. Um, this is an example of a cane farm in northern Australia. The northern part of our country is like the southern part of yours. In other words, it's warm and moist in summertime. Um, the cane is a sugar cane I'm talking about. It's here where these people are, are standing. There's rows of sugar cane through there and they've put a multi-species crop in the early stages of the cane that's got 12 different species in it, including sunflowers, which are obvious, very obvious, but there's a whole lot of other things in there as well. They've discovered that it doesn't make any difference to the growth of the cane because cane, cane's perennial and it's not going to be harvested. It takes two years to, to get to the point where it's going to be harvested anyway. But in those initial stages when the cane's growing and there's a big distance between the rows, they fill those rows with multi-species cover crop. They don't have to use fungicide in the cane. Like it's quite extraordinary what those 
microbial and my mycorrhizal networks. Remember that mycorrhizae don't act alone. You're going to have a whole lot of other microbes that are, they, they are actually channeling the carbon from plant roots out to a whole lot of other groups of microbes in the soil. They're basically part of the, they're just the highway really for, um, although I'm talking about mycorrhizal fungi, I'm talking about a whole bunch of other microbes too. And just by changing the mi microbiome in the soil, now we don't need fungicide anymore. And they use massive amounts of fungicide in, in cane fields in uh, northern Australia. It all gets out into the rivers and gets out onto our barrier reef. The uh, Australian Great Barrier Reef is 73% dead and still dying very quickly. And we've got to stop using chemicals on our farms. This is an example from Oyen in Alberta in a drought year in 2015. This is a triticale monoculture. In other words, triticale just grown on its own. And right next to it, there was a cover crop, multi-species cover crop that had eight different or nine different species in it, um, all planted at the same time. None of it's been irrigated, all had the same amount of fertilizer put underneath it. If you look at the triticale in the foreground there, you can see it's drought affected. It started to run up to head, but it's got really tiny little heads on it. It's not filling much grain. When you look at the triticale in the multi-species cover crop, you can see that it's got large heads on it. It's well filled. I mean, this wasn't meant to be harvested or anything. It was just an experiment to see what would happen um, if they had a cocktail crop there. There's no sign of any drought whatsoever where you have those nine species growing together. And I've seen this around the world so many times. It blows me away every time. You're looking at that where you've got a monoculture, widely spaced plants. Theoretically, you should think if there's low soil moisture, these should be the plants that would do better. But when you put them all in together. And uh, you know that's, that's reported from around the world. There's examples of that here in the United States as well. Jay Fuhrer talks about that a lot. There was an experiment they did at the is at the Burley County Minokan Farm, I think it's pronounced, in North Dakota, uh, where they had two, four, or one, two, four, and eight species, and they ran into a drought in 2006. It's fairly old data now, 12 years ago, and the two, four, and six um, mixes all pretty much failed, and the eight species mix was like what drought? Like they couldn't believe their eyes when they saw that. It was one of the first examples actually in North America of put eight different kinds of plants together and there is no drought. Um, and we see it time and time again. It's, it's, so what's going on? You know, what is the mechanism for this? Uh, another example that we see in Australia is that our Department of Agriculture has encouraged farmers to have bigger and bigger paddocks. They've got GPS auto steer on their tractors and things and don't worry about fences, just take your fence lines out. But this is a photograph where a fence line has just been taken out and just converted you know, what were two paddocks into one large paddock. The interesting thing about this, this is taken in a drought year, the crop has failed in the, uh, what has been the farmed area. And this, this has not been farmed for hundreds of years. This has been farmed for 30 years, which is not a long time really. Um, it's never been cultivated. It was all no-till from day one, but it's had just a monoculture of either wheat or canola or something like that and then bare ground over summer. Um, we, our, food production, our crop production systems are a little bit different in Australia to yours, but we grow wheat and those kinds of things over, over winter. Um, and then the, the ground is just left bare over summer. But here, the uh, <laughs> try here, Christine. <laughs> this is where the fence was. And where the fence was, it was just weeds and things growing all year round. So where there was a whole variety of plants just growing all year round, left to their own devices, never fertilised, never didn't have any sprays or anything put on them, they were obviously maintaining the soil beneath them. And you take the fence line out, and, and then when you plant a crop across the whole lot, it's like, what drought? You know, everything is the same except the soil underneath it. And those plants are not noticing. So if this soil had been looked after in the, in the rest of the paddock, the farmer would also not be noticing that there was a drought. We have created um, a lot of the droughts that we suffer, and I think a lot of the droughts that are being accredited to climate change, well, we are the ones that have changed the climate through our land management as much as through our fossil fuel additions. I must be getting close to... How much time have I got now, Sarah? I'm glad you're there. Uh, thank you. <laughs> 
Um, so this doesn't apply just to cropland. Uh, if we look at um, horticulture, this is a photograph or several photographs from central Otago in the South Island of New Zealand, where it is extremely dry and it's not possible to produce anything without irrigation. So these are all irrigated vineyards. And initially when the vineyards were put in, it was thought, well, you would just plant the grapevines and you wouldn't have any other plants here because water is very precious and it's expensive and you're just going to have, just going to water the grapes and nothing else. Um, and somebody discovered that if they put a whole lot of flowers in with the grapes and had the uh, inter rows were all covered with flowering plants, that that attracted pollinators and predatory insects that meant that they didn't have to use insecticide on the grapes. So people started putting flowers in and, and attracting, creating in, insectaries basically, um, so that they didn't have to spend money on insecticides because, you know, people don't really like insecticide in their wine or on their table grapes. And they're able to market it then as being insecticide free. <coughs> Interestingly, when they put these inter rows of flowers in, and these are perennial, uh, no, they're not perennial, that facilia, but these ones are perennial flowers, they discovered that their water use dropped 40%. They used 40% less water, even though they had more plants there. Intuitively, you would think, if water's really precious and I've only got enough to grow the grapes, I can't afford to put all these flowers in there. But when they put the flowers in there, they can now use 40% less water. Why do you think that might be? What, what's the mechanism that's actually happened there? Why is their water use efficiency better? Yeah, but what's it doing? What's the common mycorrhizal network doing? Yeah, it's, it's okay, so we've got where we had bare ground, what was happening to that? We were losing carbon. So where we had bare ground, we will you will always lose carbon from bare ground, always. If you're losing carbon, what else are you losing? Water holding capacity, soil structure, okay? It's degrading, it's, it's running down. It can't hold water anymore. So if we put some plants there, we cover that ground and we've got green plants there, photosynthesizing, building soil carbon, building soil structure, forming aggregates, improving the rate that water can infiltrate into the soil, improving the depth that the water can get to. So if it's right near the surface, it's going to evaporate really quickly. But you want to get water, you want water to get down from the surface, as far from the surface as possible, but still where plant roots can get it. So you've got better infiltration of the water that you add, and it's going to be held better. Remember the water holding capacity way back from 1840, we discovered an 18 fold difference in water holding capacity in the soil. We've got lots and lots of examples of that sort of thing. So by putting those extra plants in, it actually changed the way that whole landscape functions on those farms. And now you, would, you wouldn't see a vineyard in um, central Otago that didn't have some kind of ground cover in it because everybody's realised the benefits of having ground cover in their vineyards. So do you see what I'm getting at? That we, we think that we need to take green plants away to conserve moisture, but we actually need to have green plants there and a variety of green plants and preferably flowering plants. Because a lot of the natural um, large areas of the earth that are now being used for agriculture were originally grasslands. I know some areas were forests that have been cleared, but like on your continent, most of the area that's being used for extensive agriculture was grasslands. On our continent, it was grasslands. You know, you go to the Ukraine or you go to um, South Africa or those places, we're talking about grasslands or savannas usually that get converted to extensive agriculture rather than forested areas getting converted to extent. And they were full of flowers. So don't forget the flowers. When you're thinking about diversity, don't forget the flowers. Uh, this one is Facelia. So that's uh, not perennial as far as I know. I'm not familiar with that. It's not a not something that we grow in Australia, but these are perennials because that's alyssum. So alyssum is a great thing to grow in, in vineyards because it's only short, uh, so it only grows a couple of inches high. It's always got bees around it. You're always attracting and other pollinators and predatory insects. It's great ground cover. Itself, it's not going to use a huge amount of water and it's going to be there forever once you've put it in. And you can also get 
I mean, it comes in a whole range of colours as well, so you can make it really pretty. I just think the countryside would be so much nicer for people to drive through if it was all full of flowers. <laughs> so I think fields of flowers is the way to go. Uh, farmer experience in New Zealand. Uh, so this, that was New Zealand as well, but this now talking about the North Island was uh, lots and lots of dairy, huge amounts of pollution in the waterways. 90% of lowland rivers in the North Island of New Zealand are not only not swimmable or drinkable, but they're not wadeable. There's signs everywhere that you can't actually walk into the water because uh, you get all kinds of toxic, um, like horrible skin rashes and things, and it can also cause breathing difficulties. Um, because of the amount of fertiliser that's in the water that's created algal blooms and all sorts of things. I think you have the same problems, don't you, in, your, in the Great Lakes with algal blooms. And uh, it's because the farmers have just been relying on ryegrass pastures with lots and lots of fertiliser. Now, some farmers have switched to multi-species pastures like this one here. They don't need to use any fertiliser at all. And not only that, their animal health has improved out of sight. Um, and they, now that they don't use fertiliser anymore, they don't need insecticide, they don't need fungicide, they don't have weed problems. Um, urinary N is a big problem. In other words, the amount of nitrogen that cows excrete is massive when they're on heavily fertilised pastures, but they've discovered that the urinary N is now one half, which is really quite amazing, um, half of what it was when they're on diverse pastures. And it has improved animal nutrition, growth rates, milk production, conception rates, and you don't have to be calling the vet every other day. You know, in, on many New Zealand dairy farms, their vet bill was higher than their food bill because their cows were so sick. It's like, it's almost a, an animal welfare issue, I think, grazing animals on a monoculture. So it's just had an incredible effect on um, well, on the profitability of farming as well as animal welfare and the water quality issues. You know, waters are improving because of through diversity. Um, you're all more familiar, I'm sure, with the North American farmer experience of diversity, again, replacing the need for fertilisers, insecticides, fungicides, um, building topsoil and improving levels of soil carbon. Gabe Brown's probably a classic example of that. I'm sure you've all heard of Gabe. Most of you have probably met him. Um, that's just a photo from Gabe's multi-species cover crop after it's actually been grazed. So there were sunflowers and things through there, but it's all been grazed off. But you can see he's got no bare ground anywhere. Um, what hasn't been eaten has been trampled down and, and the soil is always covered. And Gabe's soil carbon has increased quite extraordinarily over time. This was a graph that was put together by David Johnson from um, New Mexico State University. And he's looking at this 20 um, And tomorrow I'm going to be talking more about nitrogen and where that fits into the, into the picture. But he didn't need to use it from here on in. He did a whole lot of trials where he ran out strips, fertiliser rates, all different rates of nitrogen, and um, couldn't see any difference or couldn't measure any difference between having none and having a whole heap. So he thought, well, none's a good answer. Um, but so there's a whole lot of things happening there. You've got diversity and you've got uh, taking nitrogen out of the system, which is a very important part of the changes that we need to make, integrating livestock. And so it's really hard to separate those factors. But the fact that he has increased soil carbon by a factor of six is uh, something that we do need to take notice of. And that's obviously going to help. So we're talking about things that are happening um, at the microbial level that really do have global impacts if we can get wider adoption of these. We can change what's happening to landscape function, watershed function, local, regional and global climate if we understand what's actually happening in our soils. Uh, I see so many parallels between this and I've, as I've mentioned several times today, the human gut microbiome. Uh, Kathleen was saying this morning that um, seven out of 10 deaths, I think, here in the United States were actually linked to chronic disease, which in turn is linked to the gut microbiome, and they're all preventable. Like, you could prevent seven out of ten uh, premature deaths here in the United States if people understood more about how the gut microbiome 
functions? Like, why isn't that the top priority for what the government's doing, even if it was only to save money, <laughs> you know, on healthcare? <laughs> like, and then when you think of all the human suffering that goes with that, you know, why aren't we focusing on that? Why aren't we focusing on the soil microbiome? It could solve so many of our problems and also improve human nutrition, like we, the nutrient density of our food, which is going to be important for our, the microbiome in our, uh, in our gut as well. It's, to, me, it's, to me, these things seem incredibly simple and basic and not that hard really to understand, except that politicians just don't seem to get it. So I was going to just uh, say a few more things, but I'm pretty much out of time. Um, I'll just quickly just do this little bit and then I'll just leave a few minutes for questions. So why have we actually overlooked mycorrhizal fungi in conventional agriculture, given that they're so important that I believe they could affect global climate? Well, for a start, they're inhibited by the use of high organic um, high analysis inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers and farmers are just piling more and more and more of those on as their soils become more dysfunctional they use more and it's really hard to go to somebody that's relying on those things and using them as a crutch and saying you know there are ways that you could transition off this and learn to farm without any nitrogen or phosphorus fertilizers and that's really scary for farmers. David talked this morning about really subsidies should be used to help farmers transition from where they are to where they need to be would be far more useful than subsidizing farmers to keep doing this. Um, but again that's going to require change in policy and how you get changes in policy I can't answer that question. <laughs> um, we do find that mycorrhizal levels are much higher in organically managed soil. So I'm talking about, um, you know, people who are certified organic producers actually have higher mycorrhizal levels in their soils, um, to which no mineral fertilisers have been applied. They are actually stimulated by organic amendments like compost. So um, we need to be thinking about the things that we add to soil, don't, we don't want to be adding things that are going to be inhibitory to mycorrhizal fungi, and we do want to think about adding the things that are going to be beneficial. Um, and they're inhibited by excessive soil disturbance. But I wonder whether, uh, something else I was going to show you. I mean, that soil there has been excessively disturbed because it's probably been cultivated six times. There's probably been six passes with, it would have been turned right over and then, um, and then progressively work down to a fine tilth. That is excessive cultivation. Um, but when we go to this option, where we still don't have any mycorrhizal fungi and we're using all those toxic chemicals, I can't help think that maybe there's going to be somewhere in between where if we have got green manure crops and there's a little bit of soil disturbance or some way of, um, I think soils on a lot of organic farms are still too disturbed, but there might be a way of, um, I really don't like the chemicals that are being used in our conventional no-till, current no-till systems. The other thing is that most of the experiments that have been done in university trials with fertilizers and things have been, the soil that's in those pots has been incredibly disturbed. It's been, um, you, you go out in a big truck and you collect a whole lot of topsoil, bring it back, it goes into a great big storage bin and it's probably going to sit there for six months or 12 months or something before it's used. So there's, there's no life, there's no plants supporting the microbes that are in that soil. It's just going to sit there and die. And then when you run a pot experiment, if you've got 200 different pots in an experiment, you're going to trial a whole lot of different things. You, you really want the soil in all those 200 pots to be as close, as uh, homogenous as possible. You don't want to have a pot over there that's got different soil in it to a pot here because that's going to affect the outcome of your experiment. So you put it through machines that homogenize it. It's a bit like homogenizing milk or something. It's going to go through something that's going to churn it all up and chop it all up and mix it all up to try and make it all the same. And then you put it in a pot. So how much life is left after you've done all of that? You put it in a pot. There's nothing there to support those plants except for the fertilizer that you apply. And then we add some nitrogen fertilizer and the, those plants grow more. Or we add some phosphorus fertilizer and those plants grow more, which is hardly surprising. They don't have a soil microbiome, okay? And then the research results, it comes out, oh, you can increase yield by adding nitrogen fertilizer or increase yield by adding phosphorus fertilizer. Now in our degraded soils on our farmland, the same thing applies to some extent. 
because there's no soil microbiome very much. I mean, there's still some microbes there, but it's not, it, it hasn't reached that quorum. I like that word. You need a cert, to get to a certain number, you need to get to a, a tipping point or a threshold, if you like, before there's enough there and enough diversity there for it really to start functioning. Okay, so we've got, we're below that threshold now on most of our agricultural soils and farmers are in a situation where the only thing they really can do, well, if they're using the conventional model and the conventional thinking is apply fertiliser. We have to start thinking differently about how to support that, that soil microbiome. So that nearly all of the research that's come out on fertilisers has been done in university glass houses, laboratories and what, and et cetera, in basically a pretty much sterile environment. Sometimes the soil is sterilised to make sure that there's no nothing in there that could uh, conflict with the results that um, you know are being looked for. So it's um, all right. Oh, and the final thing, of course. Um, again, this is just taken from a research trial, but in Australia and probably the same here, you can't buy seed commercially that doesn't have fungicide on it. And in lots of cases, you can't buy seed that doesn't have a mixture of fungicide and insecticide on it. And if you, if you want those seeds to germinate and form a relationship with mycorrhizal fungi in the first few days of life, how effective is that going to be when we've just put a whole lot of poison on the seed? So if you want to plant uh, clean seed in Australia, you have to save your own. So if you're farming 10,000 hectares and you want to plant seed that doesn't have fungicide on it, you have to have a silo big enough to save, keep enough of your own seed to, to be able to replant it the next year. So it's just impossible to buy seed that's not, not coated or pickled as they call it. So these are the reasons that mycorrhizal fungi or some of the reasons why they've been so overlooked in our agricultural systems. And I think just a lack of understanding of how important they are and what they actually do. In soil and how important those networks are. And as I said, the whole soil microbiome, I've just touched on one tiny part of it, really. So do we have any quick questions? Yeah? Yeah, so when you were talking about increasing grassland versus from one to 10, you said it would be economically worth twice the value. What do you mean by twice the value? The value of the cows eating it or Okay, so it was twice as productive in, because of the fact that it now could hold more water and um, was more fertile. So the, the land had twice the economic value in terms of what it could produce because it had tents. So it was a very controlled experiment where they just had, um, you know, one, two, I think they had one, two, four, six, ten, or something like that, different species. Um, yeah. Uh, behind you, Jack, sorry. <laughs> In one of the early slides you showed from the soil samples in the 1840s, uh, uh, organic carbon content was over 30%. Were those? Yep. Was that peat or was that just regular soil? It, seems it does seem very high, doesn't it? Um, but he said that they, as far as we know, and that it's quite a long paper that was written, like a hundred pages or something, the paper that was written from it, and it gives you all the latitudes and longitudes and everything of all the, you can go back now to the places where he collected all those samples. He was very thorough about the way he did everything. And it, they were farmed soils that were being used basically to produce uh, cereals for, um, usually for the horses, usually oats. I guess you could farm peat, but we don't have a lot of peat. I, I've never actually seen it and, uh, other than going to um, uh, Alaska or somewhere like that. I, I haven't seen peat in Australia. So it could be, uh, but there was a lot, of one, a lot of soils that were up around the 20, 25 as well. I mean, I know normally, and this is organic matter, remember, so 37% organic matter would be about 20% organic carbon, but I think above 20% organic carbon is, a, is an organic soil anyway, isn't it? In, if you, in scientific terms. Like above 20% organic carbon is generally regarded as being peat. Oh, sorry, Jack, you had a question. Yeah, when you gave your Canadian data on the Canadian research, you said higher doses of, of uh, higher, higher diversity of crops led to greater carbon sequestration. How were you actually measuring the carbon sequestration? Okay, so that was uh, higher diversity of pastures. It was the same, um, is it Brian? Brian was referring to the same article. I could send you the article on email. It's, it's about grasslands and it's about diversity in grasslands. It just came out this year, it's a 2017 paper. 
um, and it's oh, how are they measuring carbon? They just took soil samples and measured how much carbon was in the soil. Uh, yeah. I can't remember what kind of carbon. I imagine they would have measured total carbon. But I'll send you the paper and you can read it and then you can tell me what they did. <laughs> what, which kind of carbon they... A lady in green. Sorry, I'll come back to you. Yeah, the type of fungicide they apply for seed, to seed, I don't know why they apply it, quite frankly, because several weeks after uh, crop germination, quite often we see fungal diseases in those crops, like leaf spots and things, yellow splotch, yellow stripe, um, septoria, all sorts of different leaf fungal diseases. So as far as I can see, the fungicide has had no effect in terms of actually protecting the plant. So it's a fairly short-term effect. But the point being is that it's those first few days where you really want that seed in our environment, which is often dry, want that seed to form a relationship with mycorrhizal fungi. And um, even if it wasn't in a dry environment, we then want to, that to start a network where the mycorrhizae are going to be interacting with a whole lot of other microbes in the soil and supporting a lot of other microbes that are going to bring nutrients back to the plant. You know, it's going to be important for the survival of the plant in that early establishment phase for it to have a really good root system and form a good relationship with microbes. We're interfering with that, even though the fungicide doesn't seem to have terribly long-lasting effects and certainly doesn't seem to protect the plant five or six weeks down the track. You'll often, especially if they used a lot of nitrogen fertiliser, you'll just see those crops coming down with fungal diseases anyway. So I think, why did they do that? Why did they... I'm sure if you planted the seeds without the fungicide and they formed good relationships with mycorrhizal fungi in the early stages, that they would have been... Uh, their immune systems would have been much more robust anyway and less likely to come down with a fungal disease later. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good question. So not all land plants form relationships with mycorrhizal fungi. So if you had something like canola or uh, even in the home garden, if cabbages or broccoli, Brussels sprouts, all those things are non-mycorrhizal. But when they're grown in a mixture, they actually do join into the mycorrhizal network so that if you have your brassicas mixed with other plants, they become part of the common mycorrhizal network and they will have mycorrhiza linked to their roots so they are able to obtain things from other plants, but they don't give to the network. So they don't provide carbon to the network, but they are able to take nutrients and water from the network. Um, and they have other mechanisms for obtaining their, the nutrition that they need from the soil. They use other mechanisms like um, organic acids and those kinds of things to, to obtain the nutrients that they need. So even though they're non-mycorrhizal, they do join into common mycorrhizal networks if they're in a mix. And it is important to have brassicas in that mix. I think they're, they're an important part of a multi-species mix. Just don't grow them as a monoculture. So make sure you put lots of other things around your cabbages and your cauliflowers and things if, if you're a home gardener. And don't grow canola on, your own, on its own if you're a broad scale, broad acre. Uh, sorry, I should... Yeah. Mycorrhiza don't act alone, and nothing in soil acts alone. So you have mycorrhizal helper bacteria, which are MHBs. You can Google those and find out about those. Mycorrhiza can't really effectively colonise plants unless they have those helper bacteria there. And the bacteria in turn need certain viruses as well. And we find that even within plants, a lot of, uh, like even nitrogen fixing bacteria and those sorts of things within plants need a certain viruses within them for them to be able to function. You could have the bacteria there, but not the virus and it won't work. Uh, it's worlds within worlds within worlds, and I think humans are being a bit simplistic when they think we can just make an inoculum that's going to solve all of those problems. As we also heard this morning in one of the other talks, Kathleen was talking about probiotics 
really don't make it to the colon anyway, they're, um, you know, they're probably going to be digested by stomach acid before they, you know, people take, if you're not going to change your diet and just going to take lots of probiotics, it's not going to improve your gut flora. If you're not going to change the way you farm and you're just going to apply mycorrhizal fungi, it's not going to change your soil function because they're not going to be able to survive in that environment when you're still doing all the things you're doing before. So you need to think about diversity and, and uh, cutting back on high analysis fertilisers and all sorts of things that it's not going to be just a simple solution of go out and buy it in a, in a, in a jar. You have to think about supporting the soil and also thinking about it with your your organic amendments like your composts and those kinds of things too, to like increase the whole functionality, the whole soil microbiome. But if you, there are some isolated inc instances, as there are in humans, there are some instances where probiotics do work in humans and in agriculture there are some instances where mycorrhizal fungi can help. And one crop that it can help with is potatoes because they're grown in such, you know, the soil is so incredibly disturbed and then healed up and, um, so inoculating potatoes with mycorrhizal fungi actually does improve their, their growth, but there's obviously that's a refined area that they've specialised and are able to, to manage to do that. In terms of most of your broadacre crops, I would really be thinking more about diversity, multi-species covers, thinking about your soil microbiome, thinking about organic amendments rather than synthetic fertilisers and all that sort of... Do we have a... Was there a question from here? So, yes, yeah, sorry? Uh, sorry, can, I didn't quite understand. Did you say that was adding biochar detrimental to mycorrhizal fungi? Did you ask whether it was detrimental? Yeah. Well, actually, biochar can be quite uh, supportive of mycorrhizal fungi because if you look at it under the microscope, it's like honeycomb. It's got lots of little holes in it and mycorrhizal fungi can actually get in there and be protected from predation. They use it like it's a little home. They, they can, the hyphae can escape being, um, being chomped on by mites and springtails and things by. Uh, so I wouldn't see it as being something that would be detrimental to mycorrhizal fungi. Yeah, well, it, I mean, again, it depends on what kind of plant you're talking about. If you're talking about something like sunflowers or corn or sorghum that grows relatively high, there's a whole lot of understory plants that you can put in. I've seen sunflowers grown really successfully with 12 other different flowering plants underneath them to attract uh, insect predators just so that they didn't have to use insecticide in the sunflowers. And it has had absolutely no effect on reducing yield because they're all things that run around underneath the sunflowers. And similarly with corn, you just have things that aren't going to get to the height where you're going to be going to be affecting harvest. When you start talking about cereals, obviously it's a different thing, although rye grows quite tall and there's short things, clovers and things like that that you can put, put in um, with cereals. But the other thing is that modern harvesting equipment is amazingly good at separating seeds. And, you know, you can, quite often it can separate seeds based on their weight. So you'd want to put, if you put something in that, if with a cereal, if you put something in that had large seeds like peas, for example, I mean, a harvest, modern harvesting equipment is just going to separate those very easily. Or what some Australian farmers are doing is putting uh, two plants in together that will be harvested just as one thing and then separated later, and then they just sell them as two different crops because, you know, there's seed cleaning equipment that just takes seeds out of different sizes and they can easily separate um, things after harvest and they've just harvested two crops instead of one. So it's just a matter of thinking, you know, do you want them to, to synchronise their seeding and their 
um, the time that you would harvest them, or do you want them to seed at different times, or do you want you know different heights? I mean, it's human creativity really um, that we just need to think about these things. That definitely, from a technological, from a technical perspective, in terms of harvesting, it's really not an issue. Yep. Oh, okay. The, uh, sorry, what was so the beginning? How does the mycorrhizal build over the years if you're still extracting this extraction based agriculture? The mycorrhizal build when the plants are growing. Yeah, it, so taking the grain off doesn't have any effect on them whatsoever. By the time the plants have senesced, they've all sporulated. They've all produced a whole lot of those pretty little spores in the soil, and they're just sitting there waiting for the next green plant to come along. I mean, ideally, we'd have perennial uh, cropping systems, like we've we've got one in Australia. I'm not quite sure how widely that would apply here in um, in North America, of having perennial grasses that are dormant at the time of the year that we plant our winter cereals so that when the, you harvest the cereal and then you've got green grasses over summer and then they become dormant over winter and you plant your cereal. So you've got something green in a natural ecosystem or in a natural grassland like your prairies would have had warm season grasses and cool season grasses, warm season broadleaves and cool season broadleaves. At any time of the year that it rained or was warm enough for something to grow, there would be something growing there. You know, there would have been something growing there whenever it possibly could. Plants will grow whenever they possibly can, so that the mycorrhizal network would have been maintained year round. So we've gone from a mycorrhizal network that was maintained year, year round to one that might be there for five months maybe under, under a crop, and then you harvest the crop and then there's no plants. I mean, the big danger is having nothing green there. That's what you've really got to avoid. But taking the grain off, is not affecting them at all. Taking harvesting material off is not affecting them at all. It's the green growing plants that you want because they're feeding on photosynthate, which is just like sugars that are streaming out of plant roots into that and through that network out into the entire soil system. Yeah, Bob, sorry, I did see you. <laughs> the weed seed accumulators, they're still in prototype stage, I think. So uh, you're talking about the machine that as you harvest, it's sorting out the weed seeds, which are usually smaller, and uh, crushing them. Is that the one that you're talking about? Yeah. So we have got harvesting equipment that as the seed, like say if you're harvesting a cereal crop, and often the weeds have small seeds, um, then they're just separated at the time of harvest and they're crushed uh, with a separate attachment that goes onto the harvester and then they're distributed out the back of the harvester as crushed seeds which is going to add to your organic matter and they can't germinate. I think it's a fantastic idea. Uh, I'm pretty sure it will get to the stage of they, they have got several prototypes up and running. Um, they're starting to use them in England now for black grass because that's a real issue in the cereal crops in England and it's got a small seed whereas the cereal seeds are quite large. So starting to use that in, in black grass. The smaller the seed, the better, I think. What was my understanding? Because it can be separated out from the from the rest, you know, from your grain more easily. I don't know any more about it than that, but it's a good good idea. <laughs> okay. Well, we need to. Yeah, <laughs> I'm getting the signal. Thank you.